This is chapter two, the Constitution video uh, lecture. Um, in this chapter, uh, we're going to be talking about the Constitution. Duh. Um, the Constitution is a nation's basic law, and it creates political institutions like um, our Congress and our presidency, the executive branch, and our court systems. And these political institutions allocates have power within the government, and often provides guarantees to you and me, the citizens. Uh, constitutions thus establish who has power in society and how that power is exercised. This chapter examines the background of the Constitution and shows that the main principle guiding the writing of the Constitution was a concern for limited government and self-determination. Uh, the learning objectives uh, you should be able to answer at the end of studying this chapter are uh, the events that led early Americans to declare independence from Britain, uh, the review the basic philosophy that underlies the Declaration of Independence. Be able to summarize, summarize the parallels between Locke's and Jefferson's language in the Declaration of Independence. Be able to explain how the weakness of the Articles of Confederation laid the groundwork for the Constitution. Be able to describe what Madison meant by factions and how he proposed to solve the problems presented by factions. Uh, evaluate how the Constitutional Convention dealt with issues of equality. Be able to summarize the major compromises of the Constitutional Convention, explain why economic issues were high on the agenda at the Constitutional Convention and how the framers tried to strengthen the economic powers of the new national government, be able to demonstrate what we mean by the Madison model and how it is incorporated with the Constitution, be able to describe the major issues between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and ascertain how constitutional changes, informally and informal ones, continue to shape and alter the Madisonian system that was set up. So, let us begin with um, the origins of the Constitution. So, we have a, a Constitution, it's the nation's basic law, and this basic law creates political institutions. Like I said earlier, uh, these institutions can, or we, like, what I mean by that are are, are three branches of government or the theocracies, which would be or the informal or the, I don't know, formal, but like consider the fourth branch of government, um, bureaucratic agencies. So the Constitution creates these political institutions, and by your reading the Constitution, you, you know, you, you see that as you read it in Articles 1, 2, and 3, it creates the three branches of government, these institutions. Um, basic law, the nation's basic law also assigns or divides powers in government. Um, you know, not one, not one institution is more powerful than the other. It often provides certain guarantees to citizens. Our first ten amendments to the Constitution guarantee certain rights and guarantees to people, uh, include an unwritten accumulation of traditions and precedents. Um, and then, lastly, it sets the broad rules of the game of politics. So, politics is the game, and the Constitution. Are the rules of the game how this how this game is going to be played here in America? So, rules of the game, politics. That's what the Constitution does. All right. So, how do we get there? How do we get to the Constitution? Well, <clears throat> we had a revolution, and uh, the King and Parliament originally left almost everything except foreign policy and trade to the discretion of individual colonial governments, and that's how we were for the first from the beginnings of our um, people coming over to this part of, or England colonizing this part of the of the uh, world. Uh, Britain then obtained a vast expanse of new territory in North America uh, after the French and Indian War. That's like the whole, basically everything west of New York or the 13 colonies. If you know that all the 13 colonies along the coast, anything west of that was all the territory the British gained after the French and Indian War, which ended in 1763. Uh, British Parliament then passed a series of taxes to pay for the costs of def defending this territory that they gained and also began to tighten enforcement of its trade regulations um, on the colonists and how, what they, um, who and what they can trade with. Um, Americans resented this tax. You, know, we, we are, you guys already kind of know this. No taxation of representation, especially since they had no direct representation in Parliament. And uh, you got um, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party going on in Massachusetts, where people are rebelling against these um, taxes without representation. 
And so the colonists, one of the ways they responded, not just by revolting and firing upon British soldiers, but um, one way they responded was by forming the First Continental Congress back in September of 1774. And they sent a delegates from each colony to Philadelphia to discuss the future of relations with Britain itself. So everyone, every delegate, there's a delegate from every one of the 13 colonies present at this First Continental Congress. And um, because of other events like Lexington and Concord and stuff, we basically get to the point where we're gonna, we need to declare independence. Um, so the Continental Congress met almost continuous sessions during 1775 and 76, and in May and June of 1776, the Continental Congress began debating resolutions about independence. Um, so they they knew they they for, they sent a peace uh, letter, a peace offering, or olive branch petition, is what it's called, to Britain, King King George III. You know, it's basically saying we want to work things out. And when they got that, when they got his response back, which basically said, if they catch anyone um, trying to um, revolt. They're going to be considered tra uh, traitors, and they'll be hung. Um, they began to think, you know, maybe we need to declare independence, and, and this is a big deal because they're putting their life on the line to declare independence. Because if they lose, they're all going to be hung and killed for uh, this declaration of independence. So they um, start debating about independence, and after two days debate um, about what the wording of the Constitu of the Declaration of Independence is going to be. Um, they adopted on July 4th, and then we are independent, we're at war. This is written primarily by Thomas Jefferson, um, the, Const the Declaration of Independence, sorry. And, um, and one of the reasons he was chosen is because of the way um, he was, a his, his ability to write was one of the reasons he was um, chosen to write this. So, there you go, that's kind of, that's a very short version of us declaring, of where we get from declaring our independence from revolution to declaring our independence. All right, so this these are this English heritage that we brought over to America. We declared independence, and we got to start thinking about what this new government's going to look like. And um, this these idea we get these ideas from the heritage that, that they brought over from England. Um, so John Locke's writing; he's an English philosopher. Uh, especially the, his writing the second treatise of civil government uh, profoundly influenced American political leaders and just specifically um, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Locke's philosophy was based on a belief that belief in natural rights, the belief that people exist in a state of nature before governments arise, uh, they where they are governed only by the laws of nature. So kind of like these inalienable rights, which Jefferson writes, that's how he words it, but these natural rights that we have um, before a state even gets around, before there's even a government around, we have these natural rights. So natural law brings natural rights, which include life, liberty, and property, and this is according to Locke, um, life, liberty, and property. Because natural law is superior to human law, natural, because natural law is superior to human law, natural law can justify even a challenge to the rule of a tyran tyrannical king. So these natural rights are above any laws written by a um, government or king that's um, terrorizing or dictating what to do and what not to do, according to John Locke. So natural law is superior to human law. It's just something you naturally have these rights. Um, and then Locke argued that government must be built on the consent of the governed which means that people must agree on who their rulers will be. So the consent of the governed people who must agree on the rulers they rulers will be. So that's how the government should be built on. Whoever the people agree to rule them. It's, it's also called a social contract. It's a contract between the people and the government. They, they come to agreement to allow those, the consent of the governed, those who are going to govern, they allow them by voting them in or whatever way they do it, but they allow them to rule over them. Um, government should also be a limited government with clear restrictions on what rulers can do. And if you look at the the first ten amendments to the Constitution, the rights given to 
to the citizens of the of our country, but there are also limitations of what the government cannot do. You know, the government cannot take away your freedom of speech. They cannot take away your freedom um, to bear arms. They can't take away uh, a right to trial by jury. So these are all limitations um, you will find in the in the, the first ten amendments specifically on what the government can't do. Restrictions on them, the rulers. And the sole purpose of government was to protect these natural rights. Basically, we have natural rights. The people give consent to be governed, and the government's job is to make sure that these natural rights are being protected. And if people have, and according to Locke, um, extreme cases, people have a right to revolt against the government that no longer has their consent. So if they don't have their consent, he would say in an extreme case, people have a right to revolt against the government. Um, but he did stress that people should not revolt until injustice become deeply felt. And there's another English philosopher, um, Thomas Hobbes, who would, who would say that you can. He, he, was, he was more like, yes, you, you can revolt. Um, or Locke was more kind of against it, unless you really, really had to. But um, again, this idea of natural rights, um, people are governed by um, due to consent that they allow these people to govern them. And the government that is in, in charge needs to be limited, and their job is to protect our natural rights that we have. And if the people feel like they're deeply being unjustly um, treated, then the people can revolt. So this is John Locke's philosophies, and this is these are from his writings that he did prior to um, our colonists coming over here to America. And we're gonna, and, the, and Thomas Jefferson, especially, is going to, and our, or all the framers of our country, const, of the Constitution, are gonna look to these philosoph this philosophy, as part of uh, writing the Constitution. All right, so Jefferson, when it comes to America's uh, creed, um, he parallels Locke's thoughts in in Jefferson's language in the Declaration of Independence. Um, he says the sanctity of property is one of the or the sanctity of property is one of the few it is that was absent in Jeff Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, but the Lockean concept of property figured prominently at, at the Constitutional Convention. Instead, Jefferson altered his phrase life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And basically, the pursuit of happiness is the American dream of one day owning your own home, and which would be your own property. So that goes along with Locke's philosophy of life, liberty, and property. The pursuit of happiness is the American dream, and the dream of owning your own home, or your own property, of that something of that nature. So the revolution is a considered a conservative revolution. Uh, the revolution was essentially a conservative movement that did not dr drastically uh, alter the colonist way of life. Um, the, the primary goal, I mean, basically after the revolution, nothing really changes. They're no longer ruled by the, the, the king. Um, the primary goal of the revolution was to restore the rights of the colonists that they already had prior to the king started taking that away. Um, but to restore the rights the colonists felt were already theirs as British subjects. So this, this revolution wasn't, to, wasn't necessarily to change everything in an extreme way. It was just... Give them, basically trying to give them back the rights that they thought they already had or that they were ta being taken away from them um, as British subjects. So that's why it's considered a conservative revolution. All right, so we, we um, again, this is the beginnings of the Constitution. Uh, we, we declare independence, we revolt, we win the war, and then we create a government that does not work. It's, it fails, and this is... Um, from the the government was based on the Articles of Confederation, which established a government that's dominated by the states, and this goes back to um, the type of system of government that was created, which is a confederate uh, system of government under the Articles of Confederation, where it's dominated by the states. Uh, the Articles established a national legislator. That's it. The Continental Congress. That's all they it established. That's the only institution that this Constitution. Um, Created, and with one one house, there's only one chamber, and that was it. There was there's not a by it's a unicameral, not a bicameral. States could send up to seven delegates, but each state only had one votes. 
So even though we had, there are seven people from the state of Rhode Island, uh, only their state only had one vote per those seven people. So basically they had to discuss, and hopefully, I don't know, I guess they would, maybe they do a majority of the seven or however many people are there present, and that's the way the state would vote. Or maybe they wouldn't, or they'll be, at, maybe they abstained for votes just because they didn't agree. But um, it was up to them how they how they decide that. But once they provoked, Cano Congress had few powers outside of maintaining an army and navy and had little money to even do that. Uh, it had no power to tax. It could not regulate commerce, which uh, inhibited foreign trade with other nations. And and it, it, it also inhibited the development of a strong national economy by not having the power to regulate commerce. There was no president or no national court. Again, the only, only institution that was created was the Congress, the National Legislator. Continental, it's called, it was called the Continental Congress. And the weakness of this national government prevented it from dealing with the problems that it faced um, as a new nation. And... Some of those problems we're going to look at here, like Shay's Rebellion, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's some of the problems. And also the economy, it was, there was a depression after the war, and because of the, this Articles of Confederation, it was, it, um, the depression of any, and ever all the different states having different monies and stuff like that, this, uh, this type of government was not able to handle those problems. So, they needed some changes. Definitely to the Articles of Confederation. Um, all right, changes in the state. Important changes were occurring in the states, including a dramatic increase in democracy and liberty, especially for white males. Um, they were gaining more power, more um, more more men, more white males, especially, were gaining more political power and more liberties to participate in government, which is um, why this. So this is one of the reasons why the states have were changing. Um, their political participation brought a new middle class of these white males to um, to power, and these are specifically artisans and uh, farmers who own small homesteads. So the changes to the states were white males having more liberty, and this has basically created a new middle class for these artisans and farmers. And with these expanded voting rights, because before this, not everyone had the right to vote. Um, even if you're a male, there's usually, you had to be part of a certain religion or you had to own property. Um, but these, ex vote, because these states were changing, states were changing their laws and expanding voting rights, creating this new middle class of farmers and artisans and craft workers, uh, they became the majority and the old colonial elite saw their power shrink and they did not like it too much. So, like I said, the economy was one of the problems of the post-revolutionary war. Um, the depression had left many farmers, small farmers, unable to pay their debts, and they were threatened with mortgage foreclosures, which is very eerily similar to today, where people are being threatened with their homes being foreclosed because of a economic turmoil of um, with uh, the home crisis here in America, and people are now are under threat of losing their homes. Um, so very similar to post-war depression here and during the Revolutionary War. And state legislators were not under the control of the people. I'm sorry, were now under the control of the people. And there are more, because of this, this expanded power of um, middle class people becoming, becoming one of the majority, they, were more, they had more control of the state legislators and they're becoming, these state legislators are more sympathetic to the debtors, the people who are in debt to these mortgage companies. And so a few states, um, particularly Rhode Island, adopted policies to help debtors, favoring them over the creditors, the people that they owed money. Um, some printed paper money and passed forced acts, which required creditors to accept the almost worthless money. So basically the states were giving them paper money, monopoly money, to pay the, the creditors. They're giving it to the debtors, and they're, they're using this money to pay their creditors, which is worth nothing, and they had to take it, no matter, even though it wasn't worth anything. The mortgage companies, the banks, they had to take it. Um, and they're, again, this is trying to help out the people. And again, this is so similar to what's going on in America today. The federal government is trying to come up with programs and ways to help Americans today. 
um, pay their keep their homes and stay in their homes by re restructuring their mortgages or whatnot, giving them loans, but um, very similar to the Revolutionary War or post Revolutionary War as well. Um, the other problem going on during this time under the Arctic Confederation is Shays Rebellion, which was a who was a farmer in Western Massachusetts, and he Daniel Shea, he led a rebellion. Um, because he was losing, he was losing land to creditors. He was losing his farmland to creditors, and Shays Rebellion was a series of armed attacks on courthouses to prevent the judges from ruling to foreclose on their farms. So he, he and a bunch of farmers who were being going to be foreclosed on, they would all get their pitchforks and guns um, and raid courthouses and threaten judges or kill judges in some cases to make sure that their homes, their farms doesn't get for, foreclosed on. I mean, just imagine people today getting together and running to the, the courthouses and doing the same thing in America because they're, they don't want their homes to be taken away from them. That'd be crazy. And so this is part of the reason the Constitution is written because there's really no army or um, no way the national government could put down this rebellion. Eventually they did. They did, they did shut it down. But um, it, they had a raise up an army to do so. The state um, militias weren't able to put a, put away Shays Rebellion until the national government was able to raise an army um, and um, disperse this rebellion of farmers. So this spurred the birth of the Constitution. Um, before they actually got to, the, to Philadelphia, there was a meeting in Annapolis where a small group of continental leaders assembled in Annapolis, Maryland, um, but since only five states sent delegates and they issued and they issued a call for a full scale meeting, uh, or they because only five states sent delegates, they decided that they didn't have a full scale meeting in of all the states in Philadelphia. So prior to Philadelphia Convention you got the Annapolis meeting. But um Philadelphia Convention here. Delegates were given specific instructions to meet for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. Remember they um there were some few things going on here, the, econo the economy and Shays' Rebellion, that they wanted to change it. That's it. Just change change it, make it better, make it stronger, Articles of Confederation. However, they don't necessarily, they, don't, they walk away with a whole new constitution um, instead of just revising it. So a couple of reasons why they didn't revise Articles of Confederation to amend it is not feasible. It required unanimous consent of all the states, so all 13 states had to agree on anything based on the rules that was already written under the Articles of Confederation. So that just makes it very difficult to make to get anything done, to try and get everyone to agree on one thing. Um, that could be impossible at times, especially if you think about it, if you had 13 people all trying to agree on a, going to a movie or something to do on a, on a Saturday night, that could be hard to do sometimes. So <clears throat> that's not feasible. Twelve states sent representatives. Rhode Island refused to participate, so um, they weren't there. <clears throat> and there were fifty-five delegates. The fifty-five delegates ignored their instructions and began writing a new constitution itself. So, because again, it's not feasible. It was, it was kind of hard to do. So, fifty-five delegates from twelve different states were all there, and, and their whole sole purpose was to revise it. Instead, they ignored it and just wrote a new constitution and some people believe it was un they didn't have it was um, illegal what they did writing the constitution the anti federalists were um, part of that group that didn't even think it was legal for them to even write a new constitution all right so let's talk about the men in Philadelphia these guys these delegates in Philadelphia uh, these delegates are a select group of economic and political notables so they're the top of the of the the cream of the crop the top of the I don't know, the pack or the, yeah, the top dogs. Um, they're wealthy, mostly college um, grads, college educated, and they mostly lived in the coast um, in urban, and they were urbanites, which means they lived in cities on the coast. So these, these men, if you look at it, they were wealthy, educated, notables in their communities, they lived in urban cities on the coast does that I don't know if that necessarily represents 
all of the colonists at the time, because I would, because most of the people were farmers and um, middle class or below that, so they weren't these elite type people. And you can even make the argument today: Are do members of Congress represent America as well? So these are the guys who are making the decisions, pulling the strings um, when it comes to creating the Constitution. All right, so let's take that. They're going to take that philosophy of John Locke and put into action into um, their own words. Different philosophical, although they had very different philosophical views, um, which were represented out of the 55 delegates, the group agreed on questions of human nature. They all agreed on human nature, the causes of political conflict, and the, uh, and the object and nature of a Republican government. So these are the things they agreed upon. That everyone has these natural rights that John Locke would say and the causes of conflict come from groups and we're gonna look at that factions and they also agreed that um, the nature or the type of government they want to create is a Republican government and um, yeah you everybody everybody probably thinks we have a, we're a democracy or we're supposed we are do we do have a democracy but the intentions were to have a Republican government but today we have more of a democracy all right, the delegates were united also in their belief that people were self-interested and that government should play a key role in checking and containing the natural self-interest of the people. Again, this goes back to the philosophy of John Locke that the government's purpose, main purpose, is to protect your natural rights. So they agreed on that as well. Then you have James Madison, who's often called the father of the Constitution. Um, he was perhaps the most influential member of the convention in translating this political philosophy of John Locke's into governmental uh, architecture. He believed that the distribution of wealth or property is the source of political conflict. Um, so people are going to come into conflict because of property and um, that's the main that's where people disagree on things. How, how and who gets what? How gets, who gets what? This, this distribution of wealth, who gets what? So he claimed that factions, groups of people, arise from this unequal distribution of wealth. You're going to have one faction, the who's going to, whatever that faction is, the majority. They're going to be composed of many of the many who have little or no property. Okay, most people, the majority, are going to have. They're going to. There will be. They'll be considered the majority because they have little or no property. And the other faction is the minority, which is going to be composed of the few who hold the wealth. And this is where the political conflict is going to come from. The wealthy, the people who hold all the wealth, who hold all the property, and the, major, my, the majority of people who are going to be um, have less money and have less property or no property at all. And this is where conflict is going to arise politically. So the delegates believe that either a majority or a minority of faction will be tyrannical or um, threatening if it goes unchecked and has too much power, they're, they're going to be a threat if they're not if they're not somehow put in control. And what the delegates did was they said property must be protected against this this faction or majority faction, whatever the the tyrannical faction tendencies are. Um, they need to be protected, so property must be protected. And the secret to good government is is balanced government. As long as no one no one faction could seize complete control of the government, um, they, they believe that tyranny could be avoided. So as long as they could balance these two groups, these two factions, the majority and minority, um, the wealthy with property, the unwealthy without property, as long as a good government can balance that, um, where they can't one group can't have complete control, tyranny could be avoided. One group can one group would not kind of run run roughshod over the other. So that was their secret, having a balanced government. That's harder to, that's easier said than done. All right, so what's the agenda in Philadelphia? Although the constitution is silent on equality, keeping this balance, some of the most important issues on the political agenda at Philadelphia concern equality like representation of states, uh, what to do about slavery and whether or not to ensure political equality. Uh, equality. So let's look at representation of states first. How, how do they keep that? How do they make that um, equal? Well, there was one plan of our 
for Congress called the New Jersey Plan, which was proposed by William Patterson in New Jersey, which called for each state to be equally represented in the new Congress. So what, whether that be two or three, um, but it, representatives, there's, there, that's the set number for everyone, for every state. Um, Virginia, which is a large state, New Jersey was a small state, this is why they won equal representation. Virginia, which is a, which is a large state, large population-wise, they suggested by um, Edmund Randolph um, to call for a representation in Congress based on the state's share of the American population. And this is because, again, they had a bigger population and they, would, they thought they should have a better or more say in Congress. So the compromise is called the Connecticut Compromise, <clears throat> devised by Roger Sherman and William Johnson of Connecticut, um, which the solution was adopted by the delegates and created a bicameral legislator in which the Senate would have two members from each state, which would be New Jersey's plan, and the House of Representatives would have a representation based on population, which is the Virginia plan. So Connecticut took these two plans and merged them and made a compromise and created a bicameral legislator, which we have today. We have a House of Representatives based on population and a Senate, which is equal representation per state. So again, the Constitution is silent equality, but this is one example of where they, um, they try to ensure that there is equality when it comes to representation in Congress itself. All right, what about slavery? <clears throat> So the delegates agreed that Congress could limit future importing of slaves. Um, they eventually prohibited after 1808 no more importing of slaves, but they did not forbid slavery itself. And part of the reason they did not do that is because they they knew if they did, it may not be ratified and um, not passed by other states, especially the South. So they didn't forbid it, but they also but they did put a limitation on importing of slaves to be banned in 1808. Um, another issue with slavery, the Constitution stated that persons legally held to service or labor, so the people who are they're legally bounded to um, be a slave, who escaped to a free state had to be returned to their owners. So that was that stated in the Constitution. If you escape from a, to a free state, you have to be returned back. You don't you can't you're not, you're not free now all of a sudden. And thirdly, when it comes to slavery, um, the three-fifths compromise when it comes to representation and taxation, basically like how much, how many people live in your state, and how much you, your state um, would be taxed. It's all based on population. So how do you, how do you count the slaves? Or do you count the slaves? Um, the compromise, so some people wanted to count, the, so the southern states wanted to count the slaves because they made their population that much bigger. And the northern states did not want them to be able to count their slaves since they didn't have slaves and made their populations much smaller to theirs in comparison. So the compromise is called the three-fifths compromise, um, where it's based on the number of free per people. So you add up all the free people that you have in your state, plus three-fifths of your entire slave population or number of other persons. It's not three-fifths, not every person, not every slave is counted as three-fifths of a person, just they'd only count three-fifths of the entire population of your slaves to be counted towards your total population. So you take your number of free persons plus three-fifths of the entire slave population, and that is your total population. That's how they determine how um, populated your state was when it comes to representation and also taxing. So three-fifths compromise. So some people think that think of the Think of the three-fifths compromise as the framers were, were counting people as three-fifths of a people, and that's not the case at all. All right, um, political equality. Some delegates favored suffrage for all, all free, adult males, and some wanted to put property qualification on the right to vote. Um, <clears throat> there's no, it doesn't say that in the Constitution because ultimately uh, they decided to just leave the issue up to the states and the states then decided to give who the right uh, to right to vote. So suffrage, the right to vote. Um, again, some states, uh, this might have been prior to the Constitution, but some states would say, um, you have to, yeah, it's probably prior. So prior to the Constitution, that didn't make a difference. But anyways, prior to the Constitution, there was religious qualifications to vote. That was part of the suffrage. Those are the ones who could, who could vote if you were part of a particular religious group. But, um, after the Constitution, again, there was this 
expanding um, middle class coming to power because of these right these voting rights being um, or given out to more people and um, that was all up, left up to the states okay so when it comes to economic issues um, equality and economic issues the economy was an important issue at the convention itself and um, advocates of the Constitution the Federalists who were for the Constitution they stressed that the economy the economy's weaknesses and that's why they needed the Constitution so they can improve the economy while the opponents, the anti-federalists, the opponents of the Constitution, they opposed a strong national government. They claimed that charges of the, of the economic weakness were exaggerated or overrated. They weren't really um, due to the to not having a constant or a strong national government, because the Constitution does create a strong, stronger national government compared to the Articles of Confederation. So, um, anti-federalists thought that they were overrated um, those claims, but it's not surprising that the framers of the Constitution would seek to strengthen the economic powers because of their, their backgrounds. These guys are all wealthy men. They um, want to make sh ensure that their, um, their own finances are going to be protected. So uh, the strength, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to strengthen the economic powers of the new national government. Since the delegates to the Constitution Convention were the nation's post-colonial economic elite, um, some historians argue that these delegates primarily wanted these strong economic power so that their own wealth would be protected um, but evidence does not support this thesis they, they weren't doing this just as a just to protect their own wealth they also wanted to create a you know a, a great nation that was also that was part of their their reasoning um, the Constitution excuse me spells out the economic powers of Congress so again this equality with economic with the economy um, they tell, they write, explain this, write this out in the Constitution of what, what the powers are of Congress when it comes to the economy. Um, so Congress was to be the chief economic policymaker. That's kind of shifted now to the president, but um, they still do have a, they do play a key role in the um, economy of America and policy. Congress was granted power to tax and borrow, and also to appropriate funds. Meaning, appropriate means giving out money to certain agencies that's what appropriation is giving out money and then congress has also granted powers to protect property rights um, the powers to punish counterfeits and pirates so again they're trying to protect your property and uh, they can punish if they if you commit if you counterfeit money or if you raid and pirate on a coastal city um so much property that's federal those are federal offenses and you, you would go to a federal court for that and be heard by a federal judge. Um, ensure patents and copyrights, because again, that's intellectual property. They're protecting that. And then also to legislate rules for bankruptcy. And also to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. Interstate is commerce that crosses the state line. And foreign commerce is, that makes, I think that's self-explanatory. All right, and then... Fourthly, the framers also prohibited practices in the states that were viewed as inhibiting economic development. So again, again, this is all over. We're all we're still talking about the trying to make sure the economy has it's equal amongst everyone, and these are the things they did. So one of the things that they did was um, try to and make sure the states themselves didn't inhibit economic development. And one of the ways they did that was the state monetary systems. They got rid of them. Some states had their own money, and they got rid of that. Placing duties or taxes on imports from other states. Um, states are no, they couldn't put a tax on someone importing. So Nevada couldn't tax California for importing fresh fish that was caught in California to Nevada. Um, they're not able to do that. And lastly, interfering with lawfully contracted debts. Um, they couldn't get away in fear in a way of that. States were also required to respect civil judgments and contracts made in other states and to return runaway slaves to their owners. And this gets overturned by the 13th Amendment. But these are their first requirements of states. Uh, making sure that judgments that are ruled, civil judgments that are ruled in other states or contracts made in other states, they must be uh, respected by other states. And the national government guaranteed that the states 
have a Republican form of government to actually become the state of America. Say like Puerto Rico wants to become there they've always there's always been attempts to making Puerto Rico a state, the fifty first state of America. But in order to become a state you must determine you must um um prove that you have a Republican form of government, you have a Republican form of government in your state to even become a part of the state. So that's a guarantee. Um and also they prevent the recurrence of Shade Rebellion. Uh, and this is, oh, and this is because they want to make sure that there's no more Shades Rebellion. And the new government was obligated to repay all the public debts incurred under the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation, which was roughly $54 million. So <clears throat> these are things they did to make sure the economy was um, going to go on a, on, a, on a right track instead of this depression that was taking place under the Articles of Confederation. The, the, the Federalists believed that this was key to changing the economy around was creating a stronger national government, which the Constitution did. All right, what about individual rights? Equality for individual rights. The delegates felt that preserving individual rights would be relatively easy. That's still not even the case today. But um, they were constructing a limited government that, by design, could not threaten personal freedoms. If you hear my dogs barking, I apologize. They're just barking out. Uh, having they're playing outside. Um, anyways, the delegates felt to preserve their individual rights would be easy, and they constructed a limited government that, by design, could not threaten personal freedoms. So, they thought just by cr this design of the Constitution itself would um, would basically not threaten your your personal freedom, your natural rights, as John Locke would say. And they created a government that where the powers were dispersed, so that each branch of level of government could not or could restrain the others, checks and balances, and most delegates believe that the various states were already protecting the individual rights, and this, this, is, this is why there wasn't um, an Article 8 when it comes to like your rights that you have as Americans. Um, this is why they had to add those on later, because they believed that the states already protected your individual rights, and there's no need to put it right in the Constitution itself. So although the Constitution says little about your personal freedoms. It does include the following. So these are some of the rights that is written in the Constitution. The writ of habeas corpus must not be suspended during an invasion or a rebellion. And what a writ of habeas corpus is, this, is, um, this enables people who are detained, so or people who are arrested by an authority or police, to secure an immediate inquiry and reason why they've been detained. So the Constitution says they cannot suspend that. They cannot um, arrest you without any reason. They must, if they do arrest you or they hold you, they must um, give you a reason why they have detained you or arrested you itself. So this is a, something that's, that's a right that is included in the Constitution, writ of habeas corpus. Congress and states are prohibited from passing bills of attainer, which uh, punishes people without a judicial trial. So they're not allowed to pass bills of attainer, which, which says you basically can't um, have a right to a trial. And also ex post facto laws, which punishes people or increases the penalties for acts that were not illegal. So they can't pass a law and and then come get you because you, you uh, illegally broke that law before it was illegal at the time. Um, ex post facto, I mean, it was in the past, and now they're going to come back and get you because this is now a law now, and they're going to go back and look at your past and arrest you for something you did that was uh, legal at the time, but now illegal. That's what ex post facto law is. So punishing people or increasing the penalties for acts that were not illegal at the time. It'd be like, so Nevada, we just passed a, or lost, yeah, Nevada, we just passed a, um, a hands-free cell phone law, and after this law goes into effect in January, um, it'd be as if they went back and arrested you for talking on the phone prior to this law because now it's illegal and you were you did it illegally, or you did it legally when it was when it was legal, but now it's illegal and they're going to come back and um, arrest you for doing it in the past. So that's what ex pass facto law is. They can't do that. They're prohibited from doing that. Um, Religious qualifications may not be imposed for holding office in the national governments, uh, another personal freedom, and treason is narrowly defined 
and strict rules of evidence for conviction of treason are specified in the Constitution, and the right by jury in criminal case is guaranteed. So these are the personal freedoms that is it included that is included in the Constitution. Um, again, most people, most of the, especially the Federalists, they believe that these freedoms are already protected in the states, and that's why they need to, they didn't need to include a bunch of these freedoms or rights that you have um, in the Constitution. But these ones are in there: writ of habeas corpus, bills of attainer, ex post facto law, um, religious qualifications not being imposed, treason, what treason is, and how you to be how you to be convicted of that, and then the right by right to a trial by a jury. So the absence of specific protections for individual rights led to widespread criticism during the debates over ratification, and this mainly came from the anti-federalists. All right, so let's look at Madison's model. Um, the delegates were faced with the dilemma of reconciling economic equality with political freedom. So again, this is these are the philosophies they remember. This this heritage that they brought over from John Locke, and uh, they had to put it into basically they had to take this these ideas of equality economically and political freedoms and put it onto paper, and create this government based on that. And James Madison, who's considered the, the um, or he's essential to the, cons the writing of the Constitution, he and his colleagues fear that both majority and minority of factions, again, this is the, the people who own property and the people who don't own property, um, he feared that they would, um, that they would come about, and fa the factions are basically the beginning of political parties, but um, he wanted to prevent that, so he, to prevent tyranny by one of these majority of these factions, Madison believed that it was essential to keep most of the governments beyond the control of the masses, so away from these people, kind of secluded, um, away from these these factions of, group, of people. That was his. Um, that's what he was. That's how he believed he would stop or prevent these majorities or minority factions from becoming a problem. So under his plan. Um, he wanted to incorporate into the Constitution voters, electoral influence was to be limited and mostly indirectly. So when we vote, his idea was when the voters vote, it should be indirectly done, not a direct vote, which we have a lot more these days than in the past. And only the House of Representatives was to be directly elected. Um, where senators and presidents were indirectly elected, and this that changes. The senators have changed. That got modified by the 17th Amendment. Uh, and judges were to be nominated by the president only and then um, confirmed by the Senate. Um, so the idea was, again, he, he thought that the government needed to be kind of isolated or indirectly controlled by these groups, these factions. And this is why only the House representative originally was, and it still is, directly voted into office. And they only are there for two years. Um, while the senators were to be indirectly elected through our state legislators, which was originally done, and then the president is indirectly elected by the Electoral College, which now has become more of a it's kind of a, a joke, though, but that was the, the idea, and that's the goal, was to be kind of removed as much as possible from these majority groups. And <clears throat> To prevent the majority, also another way was to make sure not one government, one institution of government was more powerful than the other. And this is where you get checks and balances, separation of powers, and checks and balances. Madison' scheme was was to provide a system of separation of powers in which each of the three branches of government would be relatively independent of the others, and that not one single branch could control the others. And power was not to be separated abs absolutely, but shared among the three branches of government. And since the power was not completely separate, each branch each branch required the consent of the others for many of its actions. So, and by doing this, they created a system of checks and balances that reflects Madison's goal of setting up power against power to constrain government's actions. Again, they, they have this, idea, this philosophy of limited government. And one way to do this was, was to keep each institution um, divided up in power. So some examples of this 
the president can check the Congress's power by holding the veto power when it, when it comes to passing laws. Congress holds the purse strings of government, and the Senate has the power to approve presidential appointments. So these are checks on the president um, that Congress holds. Judicial review, which is the power of the courts to hold executive and congressional policies unconstitutional, wasn't explicitly written in the Constitution, but was asserted by the Supreme Court under John Marshall in the Marbury versus Madison case, which we'll talk about later. Um, so this is a check on this is the court's check of power on the two other branches of the government. And lastly, since the framers thought much of the government activity would take place in the states, this um, the system of government of federalism was considered to as an additional check on power of the national government, where you had shared power between the national and the state governments, and also separate powers between the two. So this is a, also another um, built-in check of power. It was a federalist federalism system of government. So that's the Madisonian model. Uh, the constitutional republic. So the framers of the constitution established actually a republic, which is a system based on the consent of the governed. So consent of the government is basically the people elect who they want to govern them, in which power is exercised by representatives, and these people are then represent you, of the public. So that's the idea. A republic is where you elect someone to represent you in these institutions, and hopefully they have they share the same point of view as you. So that was the the constitution itself is a republic. It's established as a republic. Um this deliberative democracy established an elaborate decision-making process, and the system of checks and balances and separation powers has a conservative bias because it favors the status quo, meaning um, things don't change radically. They don't, they're pretty much, they stay the same. Um, people desiring to change must usually have a sizable majority rather than a simple majority to, in order for things to change. So the status quo in this system of checks and balances and separation powers is that in order to have something radically um, done or changed in our government, you're going to need a huge majority in order to do so. So, th but this was, this was deliberately done in order to keep things um, conservative and not, you don't, you don't want to have a government that's, um, that's up and down, extreme um, changes all the time, and then there's no consistency and it's kind of hard to um, stay sane, I would think. And the Madison system encourages moderation and compromise and is more against or retards against change. I said the R word, retards change. Um, but that's it's that's how you say it. That's how it, sh it should be used in this format. Anyways, so that's what the Madison system does. It's a it's moderate, it's conservative, um, it encourages compromises between different groups of people. And not a not a not a lot of changing going on. Even though every presidential nominee who ever run for office says they'll say that they are here to change things, they're going to make things different. Um, that's not how this the system is not set up for that though, unless you have a super majority, a sizable majority to do so. All right, so that's the model of Madison. So now they got to ratify the Constitution. They wrote it. Now they need ratifying, which means to approve it. Uh, the problem is you got two factions or two groups of people who um, who either like it or dislike, and this is the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Uh, a fierce battle erupted between the Federalists, who supported the Constitution, and the Anti-Federalists, who opposed it. Federalists, which included James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, uh, they did a series of writings under the pen name of P P um, Publis, and they wrote a series of 85 articles known as the Federalist Papers in defense of the Constitution. So these guys were adamant supporters of the Constitution. They're considered Federalists, and they wrote these series of papers, Federalist Papers, in defense of it. And then you have, oh, I'm sorry, the Federalist Papers also defend the Constitution detail by detail, but also represent an important statement of political philosophy. While the Anti-Federalists believe that the new government was an enemy of freedom, um, they questioned the motives of the writers of the Constitution um, because they thought it was an enemy of freedom. And they also believed that the new Constitution was 
a class-based document which was intended to ensure that a particular economic elite controlled the public policies of the national government. And maybe to a degree that's true, because if you think kind of think about even today, I don't really know if they're always looking out for us, the everyday common folk. Maybe they're, but maybe the people who have more money than us, or at least me. Um, they fear that the new government would erode fundamental liberties and overall would weaken the power of the states. And we'll talk about that when we look at federalism. Um, but these are their fears. So they had to have, to com have a comp compromise. And to make sure that the, ratification, the Constitution is ratified, the Federalists promised to add amendments to the document that specifically protected your individual liberties. And Madison introduced 12 constitutional amendments during the first Congress back in 1789. Ten of these amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were actually ratified by the states and took effect in 1791, which was part of the deal to ratify the Constitution, was having those ten amendments. And in order to ratify the Constitution, uh, the Federalists specified the Constitution be ratified by a special convention in each each of the states and not by the state legislators. So every state had to have a special convention and in this convention they were going to debate and talk about and hopefully eventually vote to pass the Constitution um, itself. The Constitution specifies that nine states must approve the document before it to be legal or to be ratified, so they didn't need a 9 out of 13 states. Not all 13 states had to ratify it. They, they all do, but um, eventually all 9 of them do. This is why the, the, the Federalists wrote the Federalist Papers, because they were trying to persuade states that weren't going to vote for the Constitution to vote for the Constitution. There were some swing states like New York that they needed to get to the 9 um, states to approve the document itself. So they needed 9 to do so. Delaware was the first. Um, to ratify the Constitution, December 7, 9, 1787, and New Hampshire was the ninth state to do so six months later. And like I said, eventually all of them do it. But um, those, are the first, those are the first and ninth one. And then George Washington was the Electoral College's unanimous choice for president, and he took office April 30th, 1789. Again, this indirect, it's part of the Madison model, is indirect elections, um, which is the Electoral College for the president. They voted... George Washington unanimously, and he was our first president. So there you go, the Constitution ratified and approved by the states. So let's look at some changes to the Constitution or how it can be changed. It's not set in stone. The Constitution um, is a flexible document. It can Changes can occur either formally through amendments or by a number of informal processes itself. And we're going to look at these formal and informal uh, ways of changing the Constitution. So formal amendments, they change the written language, language of the Constitution. They actually, you're actually changing what the Constitution says. And in Article 5 of the Constitution, this, out, they, this part of the Constitution outlines the procedures for formal amendments. And there are two stages to the amendment process proposal and ratification, each with two alternative routes, and we're going to talk about those. So the first stage, if you're wanting to formally change the Constitution or amend the Constitution, is the proposal. A proposal can, can be an amendment that is proposed either by two-thirds votes in each House of the Chamber of Congress, so two-thirds vote in the House of Representatives, two-thirds vote by the Senate, or by national conventions called by Congress at the request of two-thirds of the state legislators. So two-thirds of our state legislators, they request Congress to have a national convention in order to propose an amendment. Those are the two ways you can propose an amendment. Basically, both ways are going to end in Congress, the proposal part. All right, so either Congress themselves come with a proposal or the states tell Congress to propose a certain amendment. That's the first step, first stage. The second step or second stage is the ratification or the approval of the proposal itself. Uh, an amendment may be ratified either by the, the legislators of the three-fourths of the states, 
So our state legislators, three-fourths of our state legislators, has to ap approve or ratify the proposal made by Congress or by a special state convention called in three-fourths of the states. And so the ratification pr process, or step, I should say, that always ends by the states. The states are the ones that ultimately decide if the proposals made by Congress are going to be ratified. So proposals are either going to they're going to end the proposals are going to eventually come from from Congress, either them directly or from the states persuading members of Congress to do so. And then ratification is either going to come by the state legislators or they have the states are going to have a convention and and decide that way. Um, all have been proposed by Congress. All 27 amendments have been pr proposed by Congress. Um, not once did uh, have the have they been have a proposal come from the legislators to Congress. All but one amendment have been ratified by the state legislators. Um, and I do believe the one amendment that was ratified by state conventions was the repeal of prohibition. Uh, the 22nd Amendment. I do believe that's what it was. I'll have to double check though. But um, there was one that was ratified by a special convention. There's, that's only, there's only been one time that's been done. But never has there been, been a proposal from state legislators to Congress. So those are the two step process or two stages to formally amend the Constitution. And then lastly, the President has no formal role in amending um, the Constitution. They have no, there's no part for them in that. Informally, that is. Okay, effects of formal amendments. Um, formal amendments have made the Constitution more egalitarian and democratic, which are um, egalitarian is one of the uh, characteristics of democracy uh, that we looked at back in Chapter 1. And let me just look it up one more time. Uh, what was it? Uh, egalitarianism is, is equality of opportunity. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's one of the elements of American democracy. The political culture of our democracy is equal equality. So the formal amendments have made the Constitution more equality, given more opportunity to, for everyone, and democratic. Uh, most important, the, the emphasis on economic, economic issues in the original document is now balanced by the amendments that stress equality and increase ability of popular majority to affect the government, and the most important effect has been to expand liberty and equality in America. Um, so the effects of the formal amendments, um, basically, they're trying. They're they're trying to expand liberty and equality in America. All right, let's look in formal ways of amending the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution changes informally as well as formally. The unwritten Constitution refers to an unwritten body of tradition, practice, and procedures that, when altered, they can change the spirit of the Constitution. And we'll look at those. Uh, the Constitution may change informally through judicial interpretation, which is main the, the main way of informally changing the Constitution is the judge's interpretation of the Constitution through political practice, through demands on policymakers, or as a result of changes in technology itself. So let's look at those um, more specific, specifically. Judicial interpretation can profoundly affect how the Constitution is understood. Um, when judges review a case or review, yeah, review a case and they look at the Constitution itself, how they interpret it can drastically change the meaning of the Constitution. And um, this ultimately will be determined by the Supreme Court, but even lower court judges, um, they set precedents uh, by the way they rule, and these rulings then will be the way that judges will rule over and over again, especially if the, when the Supreme Court makes a precedent. This is how things will be done. This is how the Constitution will be interpreted until someone else changes that interpretation again. So... Judicial interpretation profoundly affect the Constitution. Changing political practice can also change the meaning of the Constitution. Um, the development of political parties have dramatically changed the form of American government. Um, there wasn't political parties in the Constitution. There, there was nowhere written in there. We didn't have parties until uh, shortly after our first uh, 
president was elected. Um, and the first ones were I mean, mainly during the writing of the Constitution or after the writing of the Constitution. The anti federalists and Federalists were pretty, pretty much our first political parties. So the development parties have changed the form of American government. And um, changing the political practices also, has also altered the role of the Electoral College, um, which today is often seen as a rubber stamp on selecting the president because basically they... They go with whatever the the people say. Now, are they supposed to? I don't know. Some states actually have laws that say they have to vote with the majority of the people of their state. Um, some states don't. But there's supposed to be this this filter between the people and and our government, and they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be choosing who they feel is actually best for our country, not necessarily what the people want. That's why today they're often seen as a rubber stamp um, when it comes to selecting the president. You already know who they're going to vote for. Um, so this practice has changed um, informally the Constitution itself. Uh, changed the Constitution has also been greatly changed by technology. When you have mass media that plays a role in um, role in portraying candidates who are running for office, portraying policies, the way they um, they report and what they report on, they have a huge influence. Um, on, on every day, on people every day, the bureaucracy has grown. Bureaucracy is government agencies. They have grown in importance with it, with the advent of um, technology developments such as computers, um, as well, and electronic electronic communications and the development of atomic weapons or um, nuclear weapons have enhanced the president's role as commander in chief. Um, because of these dev developments, the president has a lot of power and um, can can informally um, kind of do what he wants, and uh, maybe not even, not even what the Constitution says, but they can they can because of the commander in chief, they can t totally change an outcome of war or whatnot just by those powers. All right, another um, way, uh, another informal way of changing the Constitution. Uh, is through new policies, increased demands for new policies, that is. Um, the power of the president has grown as a result of this um, this demand of new policies. The United States growth also has the status of a superpower in international affairs has located, has located additional power in the hands of the chief executive, which is we talked about with the technology of nuclear weapons, and national security concerns tend to result in more power to the president Although Congress does tend to reassert itself eventually, like through War Powers Act, but um, again, these demands for new policies either be like um, attacking Libya or not attacking Libya, um, because we're a superpower and we ha and the president has such has such a different role, has a big role as a commander in chief. Um, this is informally changes the way the Constitution is written as well, and then la uh, yeah, lastly. Domestic policy. The increased demands of domestic policy have placed the president in a more prominent role in preparing the federal budget and proposing legislative programs. Um, when presidents get elected, they promise to do all. They make all these changes. They they, they they promise to implement these new policies. And with them having a better, a bigger role in creating the budget, um, and then also telling Congress what type of laws to pass. Um, this is informal change to the president's or informal changes to the constitution itself what's important though is the flexibility of the constitution um, the united states has the oldest functioning constitution in existence today the framers created the constitution um, as a flexible system of government that could adapt to the needs of the times without sacrificing personal freedoms because technology was not on the table when they wrote this thing so it needs to be able to adapt to, to the times and even though we have 27 amendments added to the Constitution, it is a very, it's still a very short document, and it does not prescribe the structure and function of the national government in detail. It doesn't say everything what the government can and cannot do. It's it's more of a it's a framework. It's a it's the skeleton of our of our country. So it doesn't tell detail the detail what the government does and doesn't do. So. That's how the constitutional changes formally and informally. Um, here are the key terms you need to know from this chapter. Um, 
And I think that's all. I think that's it for this day. Oh, let me just say, um, so the role of the government runs through this um, runs through this chapter. This section examines the Constitution and forms, I'm sorry, the, the section examines the Constitution in terms of the theme of democracy. It looks at the impact of the Constitution on policymaking. The Constitution created a republic, not a democracy, a republic, a representative form of democracy that was modeled after the Locke tradition of limited government and um, the system of separation of powers and checks and balances established by the Constitution allow almost all groups some place in the political system where their demands for public policy can be heard. And because many institutions share power, a group can usually find at least one sympathetic ear, and these systems also promote the politics of bargaining, compromising, and playing one institution against the other to such an extent that some scholars have even suggested that there's so much checking that effective government is also is almost impossible because of the bickering that goes on. So there you go, the Constitution, Chapter 2.